Hello everybody, I'm Butch Stearns. And I'm Scott Lewer. And welcome to the latest edition of CMS Connected, the web content management industry's only news commentary show. It is the only one. It is the award-winning news commentary Have show. Have you ever figured out what awards we've won? Listen, it's a work in progress. Oh, so it's awards we've given ourselves. Um, sh if you still want to Why say not? That. Let's pat each other on the back. We're coming to you live from the Seaport Hotel in downtown Boston at Kentico Connection Boston. Scott and I, we usually do this show in studio. We do. But we've got a live audience on site. How about a round of applause with all of you in the audience here at Kentico Connection? You know, I feel a little exposed up here. I kind of forgot that we can't wear <laughs> jeans below the table today. Somebody should have let me know. We are throwing ourselves to the wolves we today, are, my we friend. Are, we are. They are going to ask us questions. <clears throat> By the way, folks, you can ask questions of our panelists of this show. Um, and let me introduce our panelists right away. Heather McFadden, Vice President of Falcon Software. Nice How about a nice round of applause for Heather? Next to Heather is Michael Kincaid, Director of Application Development at Eccentric Arts. Or at the end. Oh, that's Michael at the, at the end. end. I'm sorry. And in between them is uh, Brian McKeever, Solution Architect and Co-Owner of BizStream. Okay. All right, so we will get to you guys in one second. And again, you can ask questions of our expert panelists because we're going to dive into this subject. And Scott, it's a subject that's ongoing. It's a subject that you're passionate about. I kind of pretend I know what I'm talking about when it comes to this. But what we all know is that in digital marketing today, yeah. that you have the need, you have the responsibility almost to engage your customers and your prospects like never before. They have most of the power. So having the right CMS solution and integration partner are vital to your success as a business or your client or your customer success. And so today we're gonna to focus on the common pitfalls in yep. picking the right CMS solution and right CMS integration partner. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, it's, it's an important point. It's something that you know a lot of folks here, uh, people feel this pain every single day. This is what we're working with um, in terms of folks are trying to, trying to find the right one. But I think what we're going to talk about here on the panel today is it's not just about that right technology, right? It's about an awful lot of other things that go into that, go into making success, and also are the causes of failure. Right. right. So we're going to get into the questions. Scott and I are going to drive some questions for our experts first. But again, if you would like to ask questions, Jessica is in the back over there. Jessica, we'll stand up. No, so everybody could see. How about a nice round of applause for Jessica Mc McReynolds? McRoberts. I'm sorry, Jessica. Uh, Jessica will be showing them where the mic is. Jessica, you can step up to the mic in about 15 minutes and ask questions there. Now, also, just for attending today, you could win this tech basket, compliments of CMS Connected here. If you have a ticket, anybody not have a ticket? for the tech basket. It's not doing good for the audience at home. You're gonna have to go outside and find where you can get a ticket. You should have got one on your way in. We will be picking a winner for this tech basket later in the show. Now, I'm not gonna say if you ask a question, you have a better chance at winning the tech basket, but. You know, I was gonna say it. I All think right, one so you can say, say that. Yeah, one should one say should that. Say a moment right now for you and the viewing audience. Again, we're streaming CMS Connected live like we do every month on this show to thank our lead sponsors on CMS Connected, and they are Falcon Software. The people at Falcon Software can provide you with expert advice and integration solutions for all your creative web design, web content management, and e-commerce, social, or mobile needs. And Digital Clarity Group, a company you know a little bit about as the principal analyst. Um, uh, DCG is a research and advisory firm focused on navigating organizations through the digital transformation process. All right, are we ready to go? I'm ready to go. Are you guys ready to go? Yeah. And are you guys ready to go? Yes? There we go. So let's kick off CMS Connected again, live here from the Seaport Hotel in downtown Boston, um, talking about the common pitfalls of picking the right CMS solution and integration partner. So let's start, and we're going to ask one of you a quick question first to get everything started. And again, if you have questions, go right back with Jessica, and we'll take some of your questions in just a little bit. Uh, Heather. Um, why do so many CMS projects fail? CMS solutions have evolved over the years. There's, there's some of the same common problems, aren't they? But give us the main reasons why so many CMS projects fail. Well, I think uh, uh, there's a lot of different reasons because it depends on who it is that is saying the project has failed. What failed? Did it go over budget? Did it not meet the timeline? Did it not meet the client expectations? Did you choose the wrong technology altogether? Um, 
And did it just not, did, it, did the post-launch activities not happen? You know, it doesn't end when you deploy the project. It, you have to continue to nurture it even after you have finished the deployment and the implementation. So you have to make sure that the content strategists are in there doing their thing, that the, the, the um, upper management is, is on board with it, that they're okay with what you're doing and that they're on board with the whole plan. So I think it comes back to what's, what makes it a success. What makes it a success is proper planning, uh, make sure you've got uh, proper expectations, you've set the right expectations, and that you have the plan for post-launch and you nurture that, you keep that going. Yeah, absolutely, I think that's a really good point, actually, it's a very good point that you say, which is who defines failure and failure versus what, right? So what was the original goal? I think we see an awful lot of organizations, I know, that come to us and they say, we want to find a CMS technology, and I'll say, okay, to accomplish what? What's your pain, what's your, and oftentimes they haven't thought through that. So what do you guys see, Brian and Michael over here, whoever wants to jump in, what are some of the things that you're, you know, that you're seeing customers trying to achieve in the first place, and then I guess we can talk about failure. Sure, I mean, our customers are usually trying to achieve very basic things, and that's increase leads on their website, convert people, attract more traffic to their site. At the end of the day, their site, hopefully for them, is a, a tool that leads to increased sales. That's why we do web. That's why we do social media. We try to attract new people. We try to retain current customers and have rich content that makes them want to come back to the site, right? You don't want the same boring thing over and over. Hopefully, we're um, giving our customers tools to create rich content, to keep people coming back for a reason, make it easy for them to convert and to buy or subscribe or whatever they want to do. So I really think that it's, it's still pretty basic what you want your website to do to succeed. Yeah, and to determine success, you really want to be tracking as much as possible. Like, how do you know if a project has failed? You need to have clear objectives that you want to actually be able to reach. So you want to make sure that you're, you know, you're looking at your Google Analytics, you're seeing you know, what the traffic is, the baseline for this version of your site. And then as you go into building a new site, you want to make sure you've got clear objectives, uh, what you want to actually be able to, to reach and be able to come back at the end of a project and, and look at the, you know, the data and see whether or not you've reached those goals. I think a really interesting point about what both of you, all three of you just said there is um, where I really like that this has gone is it shifted from the CMS project being defined as the project to implement the CMS. Right? Because what you're talking about is all post-launch, right? That launch is really kind of day one of the CMS's life cycle, and it's kind of talking about um, failure from, from that point onward, right? I mean, certainly we see implementation projects have challenges, but what we're talking about is kind of after that point. Your optimization point is really great. So let's jump into, I think, what's a classic um, question from many organizations, especially when it comes to CMS. Who's responsible? for implementing it within your organization. It's the old CIO, CMO disconnect, or is it IT that's responsible? Heather, let me start with you. Who should be responsible, or is that a different answer depending on your company? Well, I think it does differ on the company, and I think that it's, it's a collaboration. We're not, we're, we're not in the silos anymore. We're not in, okay, marketing owns this, and IT owns this, and just because marketing has a more, t you know, more technical savvy marketers out there and working with the tools doesn't mean that IT is less valuable or that they have less of a, of a position in the whole, the whole deployment or the whole project um, ongoing. It needs to be a collaboration. And I guess it depends on the organization too and depends on what, what resources you have available. If, if there's IT people that, I think, spin back a little bit, I believe that the more well-rounded your resources are, the more technical savvy marketers you have, the more uh, content savvy, marketing savvy your IT people are, I think the better your success is gonna be. So, so let me ask a direct follow-up for either one of you guys. Who should own, in an ideal situation, a CMS implementation? Who should own it? IT or marketing? Or is there no direct answer to that? I, think, I don't think there's a direct answer. Like You want to make sure you get just the best team of people and the, the right stakeholders, people who can make those decisions and can then you know, bring them to the company you know, across the entire organization. Um, I think there's a problem whenever you end up with these siloed approaches. Um, or it's being driven really by one department and it's not being shared with another. Um, really, you want the organization as a whole to have a strategy in mind with what they, what they want with their new CMS, what they want to achieve with that CMS. Um, otherwise, the project can't be successful because you're not going to get buy-in across the entire organization. And that's you know, to the point of post-launch, you know, what's going to be the uptick on the CMS. You want to make sure that the organization are aware of the features that are available to them, that they, you know, they can actually use the platform. They're properly trained in the platform as well. Otherwise, it can't be successful. 
Well, I'm going to take, I'm going to take a little different approach to that answer. And I'm technical. My background is developer, programmer, and I've kind of moved up a little bit in our organization. But the easy answer would be for me to say IT because of my background. But I believe it's changed in the last five or six years. And I believe, actually, IT should get out of the way and let marketing do its job. I think we have tools. CMSs, in general, are more advanced. It's less and less of moving ones and zeros for programmers to do things. And I don't think I, marketing departments should be held back by, I want a landing page or I want to run a campaign. I have to go talk to the developer to do that. You should have the right tool that lets you execute quickly, create those landing page, measure, like you said, Mike, which is really important. And they shouldn't have to wait on IT. I think there's things like the cloud that they can leverage to host things. And, and it makes it uh, more of a marketing and business call and business oriented type of metric and success that they're, they're driving, hopefully, with their content. Because the content comes from marketing, or at least it should, I guess. Uh, and I think IT, they should support marketing. But at the end of the day, I think they should step out of the way once it's set up and let, let it run. So how many of you in the audience are primarily focused in IT? Raise your hands. So watch out for Brian on the way out. Get out of his way. Do not stand in his way if you're in IT, OK? You're watching CMS Connected. Again, if you're a regular viewer of our show, it is a monthly show sponsored by Falcon Software and Digital Clarity Group. Today, we are coming to you live from Kentico Connection Boston. It's a series of events that Kentico puts on. Um, and this one is in Boston, of course, right in our backyard, the Pulse Network, where we put on this show with Falcon Software and Digital Clarity Group. The subject of today's show, if you're just tuning in, is common pitfalls in implementing a CMS system and choosing the right partner. Go ahead, Scott, take it from there. Sure, so let's get into the team thing. I just want to pick up on what you were talking about there. You mentioned silos. I hear silos mentioned an awful lot, and they're usually mentioned in a fairly negative context, right? They're always written about silos, silos, silos. Look, on a farm, I've never lived on a farm, but I'm going to speak uh, as if I have. Uh, so on a farm, silos play a really important role, right? They keep the wheat from the grain, from the whatever. The point about silos is that you have to be able to harvest the, 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 the grains when appropriate from each one, right? So I think keeping things separate. And in the same way, on a team, if you've got different members of the team, the point is, is what is the role that they're playing on the team? Do we all have a common goal, like you were saying? I think, Brian, you mentioned, or, or actually, Michael, I think you said, do we have a common goal? And does everybody have kind of a role to play on that? Do they know their role? Right, so I think that's the whole idea. Um, so then, coming back to then to the to the to a question is, at what point, kind of, when do you bring in outside partners? And all of you have some interest in this. Uh, versus, try not to show your bias too much, by the way. Um, uh, when do you bring in outside partners? Versus, what responsibilities do you, do you delegate to the team? Who wants to take that? Maybe why don't we start with Michael down at the end? Can you talk about um, that? It really does depend on the clients and what their sort of comfort level is. Like we've got clients that you know really benefit from bringing somebody like ourselves in as soon as possible. Other clients you know, from larger companies have really impressed us whenever we've engaged with them and they've arrived with you know, their digital strategy in place, their content strategy in place, their personas already identified, their audience identified. So it, it does depend. Wait, you have clients like that? We do. We, we, I, yeah, yeah, like they're amazing. Um, so, but it, it, so it does depend on the client. Like obviously we're going to say you should bring us in as soon as possible. Um, you know, we see sometimes we'll get RFPs and there's just there's no detail on them. And you can tell that if you were to engage that there's going to be an awful lot of work even just to get to the point of a project sort of starting point. Um, other RFPs have got a lot more detail. So I think the organization themselves, you know, whenever they're in the RFP process, should be able to self-identify as to how much help they need. You know, do they need to go out and reach out to consultants to get you know, additional help to be able to drive the project forward? I'll just make a comment back on that, which is, you know, I, because I don't have a dog in that fight, I'm not, a, I'm not a, an outside uh, vendor or an agency. No, you're a farmer. Hey, <laughs> you're right. I am a farmer. Okay. I, brought, I forgot my overalls today. But the, the um, point is, is that I do think that it's super important. As an analyst who's hel helping folks all the time with this, I think it's extremely important that you are looking to experts to help you guide you. Now, whether you bring them in for the full-blooded thing or whether you're having them do milestone review points because you want to distribute some of that responsibility yourselves, I think is, a, is kind of up to you to gauge. But the point is, is these companies who go it alone and try to kind of take this all on themselves because we know Java or whatever, uh, Sorry, uh, .net. <clears throat> um, you know, then you know that's that's just kind of silly point. But don't don't rely on those experts 100%. I fully believe that the organizations that are implementing those CMSs need to educate themselves, 
and understand what the tool is. If you're just going to sit back and say, okay, you expert, you go do the whole thing. I don't think that's work. I think it's a collaboration between yeah. the partners and the customers too. I think that's the most success, successful recipe. Yeah, definitely. Like once, once they have selected a CMS, they, the organization really needs to embrace that, yeah. learn it. Because yeah. um, again, ideally when the project is over, you know, we're really coming on board for, for new plans, new projects, new phases, but they're able to do the day-to-day -day work. They're able to do their own marketing pages, be able to, you know, implement those, let, set them free, track them, optimize their website, and do this activity themselves, but that requires them to invest some time and, and to learn the platform. Having people on the panel with foreign accents because they always just sound smarter than you do. They are. <laughs> well, that's valid. <laughs> smarter than you. You're just a sports guy, aren't you? Whatever. I am the expert when it comes to CMS Connected, okay? In indeed. Weekly build, don't forget. CMS yes. Um, okay, any questions from anybody in the audience? Please don't be bashful. Raise your hand. We'll come to you, bring you over there, ask a question for our experts and our panelists. We're going to be taking a break coming up for the audience at home. And then uh, we're going to get into some deeper questions after that. Anybody have a question right now? OK. Um, so you asked a question about engaging outside partners. Let's ask the follow up. The big bang or a phased approach to deployment, which methodology drives more success more often? Heather, start with that one. <laughs> it's the same answer. It, it, it always varies, I think. I don't think there's one black and white answer, but I think a phased approach is probably going to glean the ultimate success, and it's identifying and planning what those phases are. If you try to do too much at once, something's not going to, something's not going to work. Some person's not going to be doing what they're supposed to be doing or meeting their timelines or whatever. I think that uh, uh, broadening that scope or you know, letting it be, let's do phase one, let's get the base in there, let's get people trained. Because once your clients know, or I find once our clients know the product, those second phases become so much more exciting to work on because all of a sudden you're collaborating with them. Yeah. You're, they, yeah. They're as much help as you are. They know their business. We know the CMS. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, think, sorry. No, I really like the phase approach. I mean, I think that goals and site requirements, they change very quickly. And we have to move really quickly. If there's this new uh, product launch or campaign that happens, social media activity that has to happen. So the big bang approach, it just doesn't work. It, it feels like going back in a cave and coming out with something later that you've never shown the customer you know, we've seen with the organizations that we work with that if you can show them something visual very quickly, as soon as possible, they're going to get a good sense of how it should work first. And, and content matters in this situation as well. Because we were just talking about this this morning with some of the attendees here. You know, you can put a, a wireframe up and you can put three words in a title, and then they come back with a 30-word press release that they want to yeah. fit in that spot. So your wireframe doesn't matter anymore because it doesn't fit the way it should be shaped. And you're going to have to just change that probably to make it fit in. So if you can even use real data as opposed to Latin text, yeah. you know, we've all done that probably, but yeah. I think um, like pr we prefer phased approaches, um, certainly in mid to large projects, when you've, you've got to adopt a phased approach, you're not going to be able to take on board, you know, a substantially large project and, you know, trying to deliver on that with just one big release can, can be very complicated. Um, obviously, with you know, very small projects or, or even small phases, you can use sort of like that big bang idea of you wanting to introduce something large, but or not large, but something new. But certainly, phased approach would be would be more ideal. You were watching CMS Connected. Sorry, we're checking our Twitter feeds again. If you would like to, uh, you could send some tweets in and questions from the audience too. If you don't want to get up in front of the microphone, the uh, hashtag for the show, uh, this show is Kentico Connection. Hashtag Kentico Connection. Uh, and you can tweet at CMS Connected. And we'll read your tweets on the show. Again, the subject of today's show in this monthly edition of CMS Connected, live here at Kentico Connection at the Seaport Hotel uh, in downtown Boston, right on the waterfront, is pitfalls, common pitfalls in implementing CMS solutions and uh, picking the right integration partners. Let's go right back to the beginning of it, Scott. What are some of the biggest problems? Maybe you want to bring up a specific case study or a specific, not a client, I would imagine, but what? give us a reason or something that recently, you travel a lot, you've been at a lot of conferences, mm -hmm. why do systems fail? What are, what are some of the big reasons that they fail? Well, listen, um, in the, for the same reason why, and so again, let's, let's question, so you're asking why do systems fail as opposed to kind of why do marketing strategies fail? Let's just narrow this specifically and just talk tech for a minute. We're at a tech show. It's kind of a tech show. Um, so 
why do they fail is part of this, frankly, I'm gonna, I'm gonna point to these guys and start a little, bit of a little bit of an argument here. Whether it's between you or between all of you and me, one or the other, we're getting a fight going here because there's a little too much kumbaya going right now. Um, which is, they fail for the same reason that they tend to succeed, right? Which is, again, because of the team. All of you do a lot of implementations. Um, what I see oftentimes is when I'm going in and, and replacing technology for folks, it's usually because it was a botched implementation of some sort. Folks went off the ranch, they went rogue, they actually didn't really know the technology very well, didn't make good use of API, like let's not get too techy here, but they didn't make good use of the product and what it can actually do very well. And so oftentimes we're replacing a product that has a bad name or has grown a bad name politically within an organization that ult ultimately could have probably done the job quite fine. And one of you guys botched it. So I think usually the, the, the reason for failure is because of the implementation, whether that's done by the company or by a team. I think um, you know, picking the wrong You're CMS. To agree with You're supposed to argue. Pick, picking, well, no, picking the wrong CMS is bad, but picking the wrong implementation partner is by far worse. Like we have inherited some projects, um, and you, you, you log in and you have a look at how it's been built out, and it's, it's mind boggling. You know, it's, it's as if they haven't even read the developer's guide to actually understand how to use it. Um, and you're right, it can cause a real problem because then that product gets a really bad name in the organization. And if you're coming on board and you're trying to then take that product to sort of the next implementation, the next level, it can be very hard to sell that through to the organization that just they have a bad opinion of it at that point. Yeah, yeah but Michael, don't you think even if you have a great implementation partner, who picks the wrong tool to accomplish the task that that website or that web project should do, totally. that, that plays a big part of it. Yeah, totally, but it's, 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 I don't know, is it more disappointing when you've got a tool that you know can be so good, and then you go in and you look, and it just hasn't been done right at all, um, and it's very hard to overcome that negative impression that the client might have, but yeah, totally, you can, you can easily mess it up the other way. So I'll give you an, an example. We, we've worked with uh, some companies that are really good at web and SharePoint. And they try to make SharePoint this really great web content management front end to make a very pretty multilingual, very large website. Yep. And that's kind of like taking a wrench and expecting it to fill a swimming pool. Totally. It's just not even close, yeah. right? So I think that you have to do two things. You have to pick the right partner, but you have to select the right technology to, to do what you want to do. So I, 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 I think they're both equal in the equation. Yeah. I'm going to disagree, but we'll. Um, should well, I, no, shall take I it from the other side. Okay, let's do this then. So, the SharePoint one is a tough one, right? We can all beat up on SharePoint. I beat up on SharePoint a lot, right? Let's just take SharePoint and park it for a second. Um, by the way, Ferrari.com had a, like a gazillion hours of implementation time and didn't use anything of SharePoint, just to be clear. But um, other than that, Brian, I disagree with you um, because I think that for the most part today, um, in terms of what one would consider a failure or a success, the kind of the kind of basic requirements of that, uh, again, of the system, not necessarily of a strategy, um, that most of the CMSs today can probably get the job done. Some are better at some things or not, but I think for the most part, a a well, you know, um, a, a good team can get it pretty much done, can get can get the job done on any CMS. You disagree yeah. with me though. Besides SharePoint, park your SharePoint Besides, example. Okay. All right. Um, SharePoint for web. It's not, yeah, I by guess the way, even selling it. It does that. depend. I still go back to the task that you're trying to do. You know, there's a lot of .NET CMSs that do a great job. There's a lot of open source CMSs that also do a great job of presenting it. But there's a bunch of holes in open source CMS just because they have probably a larger market share and there's there's more sites out there, so people hackers maybe pay more attention to them and they look for vulnerabilities. Where on the .NET side of the fence, we can get away from some of it. I can't, I can't say we're, we're fully invulnerable from vulnerabilities, but um, I just think that uh, I've heard too many times that people coming to us as a technology partner and having the problem of, oh, my site just got hacked. There's got to be something better. And it's probably a really good team that put it together in Drupal or Joomla or, or whatnot, but the tool is kind of not the greatest. So I'm, I don't know if I can agree with you. Gotcha. Great. All right, time for us to take a quick break. How about another round of applause for our panelists, Heather McFadden, Michael Kincaid, and Brian McKeever. We are going to take a quick break. Again, you're watching CMS Connected live from the Seaport Hotel in downtown Boston. Scott Lewer, Butch Stearns, uh, co-host of CMS Connected with our expert panelists. Some questions from you in the audience. Hopefully, when we come back, we'll be giving away the tech basket before the end of the show. And now let's take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, or in this break, we will hear from eSpirit. Back with CMS Connected right after this. The music. 
the laughter, the cheer. It's the most wonderful time I, of I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Except for these guys. This is your web team. They're wrung out. They're frazzled. And they're scared. Scared they won't get the new product content out to your customers in time. Scared your competition will get to them first. Scared the slightest delay will mean lost revenue and, worse yet, their jobs. There are no visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads. They're drowning in data and systems. They're trying to pull content and information together from every nook and cranny. From technologies like Demandware, Salesforce, SAP, IBM, LifeRay, Brightcode, and even in-house proprietary applications nobody's ever heard of. What's worse? That content needs to be posted to your online storefront, to your company's website, in campaign emails, on mobile devices, customer service portals, and across social media. And it has to be personalized at every touch point of the customer journey. Right now, the clock is ticking. The competition is looming. But it doesn't talk for a little bit. Hard. Say their question, all right? You, you take it from there. We're coming back in a second. Enjoy the laughter, enjoy the cheer, and enjoy the revenue. <clears throat> with a content management solution that easily integrates with all your systems so that everyone can enjoy the most wonderful time of the year and every day after <clears throat> that. E-Spirit, playing now at a website, portal, and online storefront near you. <clears throat> And welcome back to CMS Connected. I'm Butch Stearns. And I'm Scott Lewer. Why don't you take it? Why don't you do the research? All right, and this is CMS Connected live at Kentico Connection in Boston, Massachusetts, here at the wonderful, where are we again? Seaport Hotel. Thank you, the Seaport Hotel. Vince and our Tumblr. panelists. And our Heather panelists. Heather McFadden from? Yeah, go, why don't no, you go ahead. No, you go. All right, let me see. Heather McFadden. We got Brian from, Brian's last name is? McKeever, it's close. McKeever yeah, yeah. from right. Big Stream. And Michael? Kincaid. Kincaid. See, I'm on the spot, man. How about a round of applause for our panelists from Scott? I don't have to know these people's names. You guys are great. This has been good so far. It's great. Are you guys ready to take some questions from the audience? We're throwing yeah. you to the wolves now. You ready? Yeah. All right, let's go. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> let's go to the lovely Jessica McRoberts. Jessica, how are you? Step right to that microphone. I'm doing well. Our audience wants to see. How are you today? I'm good. Now, you're with Kentico, right? Yes. So you're going to get our questions for our panelists, right? So who do you have with you? Well, I have... Hello, my name is Brian Soltis, and uh, I'm a Kentico developer. And my question is, how much do you see a client's unwillingness to upgrade or actually, you know, apply hotfixes contribute to the the disastrous scenarios that you're discussing so intimately? It's to all panel members. How just, unwilling? Because uh, we, we encounter a lot of clients that are, for financial reasons or other unknown sure. reasons, just unwilling to upgrade their product, and several CMSs are constantly pushing out new versions and, and fixes and enhancements to the platform, sure. and their unwillingness to, to make the financial or time investment to apply them surely has to compound these, these failures and these projects that never quite finalize and, and become off the ground. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I think it's a great point. What do you yeah. do? with someone that's unwilling to do that. I mean, you have to get past that first step, don't yeah, you? Well, it, definitely, like, it definitely hurts in terms of, you know, there's, there's definitely security reasons why you want them to hot fix. So you need to approach them with that and say, look, you know, there is a vulnerability. Um, there can also be that contradiction whereby they're, they're looking for these features that are gonna be available in an update, um, but yet there's the unwillingness to do the update that will provide them with the functionality that they're looking for. So yeah, it's as to whether or not it leads to an actual implementation failure, um, really depends on whether the security issue is big enough or the feature request is uh, large enough for it. But yeah, you, you try to minimize the pain of upgrading and hotfixing as much as possible. But really, it does depend on how much you've customized the actual build as to whether or not it can be you know rolled out very easily. So yeah, it can be a, it can be a you know it, it needs to be an honest conversation with the clients if you've done a lot of custom development uh, to explain you know what are the steps involved in a hotfix procedure or in an upgrade. Um, and then you just try to come to a compromise where maybe you're just going to upgrade maybe every quarter um, and hotfixes will be done when there's actually something in the hotfix that can be applied to their build, um, whether or not it's a security issue or it, maybe it's a bug that the client has come across. Yeah. 
So again, not to bang too much on the IT side of the fence, but when you explain hot fix and upgrade to IT directors or developers, they tend to get it and, and just go along with it because they're used to that cycle. I think the harder part is when you have um, business people in the room, marketing people in the room, to explain to them why you need to hot fix is actually a real challenge. And what I like to do is talk about risk. How much risk are you willing to take on your website that's exposed to the public? What could they do or what could you lose, especially in an e-commerce scenario? Can you maybe let a product order go out the door at zero dollars? I mean, how much could that possibly cost your company? And, and talk about what happens if you don't. And not that I want to scare them into that, but I want them to understand there's safety with patching. There's stability reasons. There's good reasons that a vendor is releasing an upgrade and a hot fix. And I tend to not go too much to the new feature part of it because that's kind of expected. Um, I, I like you know if you're if you're keeping up to date, and I think the strategy really comes from the way Microsoft does Windows updates. It's really no longer a choice. It's like, no, on Tuesday, I'm going to reboot your machine. I don't really care what you had open. I'm going to make sure that you're hot fixed. So I, I'd like to take that and tell, if Microsoft does it this way, they've probably figured something out, right? So let's also take that approach and keep things updated. Now, of course, the financial aspect of it has to come into play a little bit. Um, but hopefully, like what Michael was saying, that you've done your code the right way. And, and it's not a 50-week project to upgrade. It's a couple-day project. I I think the, the point then should be for the audience, the local and the wider audience, that um, if one of the things that tends to uh, cause organizations to not be able to upgrade as quickly as they'd like to or as swiftly as they'd like to, um, if that tends to kind of, to what you were saying, Michael, relate oftentimes to the amount of customizations that they tend to have, I think we need to start getting really smart about taking those on or not. Understanding really, I know what it's like oftentimes, you guys in the, in, the, in the position of being a partner are often trying to counsel them about, well, yes, I guess we could do that if you'd like, um, but here are the consequences. So I think we have to be smarter about making sure that we're setting expectations about what all the implications are of going kind of off the ranch a little bit, um, and customers have to be smart about knowing that, that the implications tend to come in, in these things. Do you have any well, comments there? I was going to say that I think the client has, it comes back to planning and expectations. The client has to understand it's an investment they've made to maintain their investment. You're going to maintain your car, you're going to maintain all, you know, anything else that you own. You have to maintain your CMS solution. You can't get too far behind. I think I'm 2,000 miles overdue on my oil change. It's, I think it's a great analogy, and it's, it's the perfect way to put it, that it's not just plug and play and let it go. I mean, things are changing daily, uh, but the need to engage your customers and your customers' customers is always there. So your system has to constantly evolve. And I mean, is it as simple as saying you get out of it what you put into it? Yeah, probably. You can make that simple analogy, yep. Uh, let's go back. You have, did you have a follow-up? Oh, no. Sorry. Thank you. She did call me simple, she but that's okay. Simple. I am pretty simple. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. I appreciate that. Do we have another question? All right. Next we have a Simon. Hi. I'm uh, Simon Lassen. I'm from a, a Kentico partner in the UK. Um, I think one of the areas that perhaps hasn't been covered that uh, influences the success or otherwise um, of a CMS project can often be the influencing solutions that you're connecting with. Um, so, for example, a CRM project or an ERP platform. Um, and so my question is, when you have a project where the client is looking to implement both the web solution and one of those other platforms, what would your advice be to them in order to guarantee success? Nice. Another, why, why do another people from the UK always sound so cool? That's it. Again, That's another it. question from another person with an accent. It's right. really annoying. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks for your question. By the way, where are you from? What, I know you said you're from the UK, obviously, but what, what partner? Uh, so Ridgeway. Ridgeway? Ridgeway, yes. Just give yourself a shout out for that. Good. Thanks for the question. Any thoughts, guys? When you're being asked to implement two solutions simultaneously, um, what, what's, how, what's that like? Yeah, obviously, integration is a key. Uh, I like to tell people that if you have um, an ERP system and a web content management system or a financial system in your website, anytime that you're entering things in twice manual with a human involved, there's a problem with that. It can go wrong, uh, it's slow, it's costly. There's pretty much, in today's world, a way to integrate just about everything, whether it's a built-in connector from one product to another, whether it's an API or a web service. And, and actually, the integration point itself is fairly inexpensive, for the most point, to develop or reuse from like a marketplace solution. I mean, I don't want to go to plugins, because we already have that discussion about open source. But I think you have to deliver an integrated solution that allows people to take data from the web and have it show up in the other system automatically. And if you don't integrate, I think you're at a huge loss. So I think it's a big point uh, to make sure that you 
have planned two systems that can play nice together. Michael, before you jump in, I, saw, I think I saw you just want to jump in. I mean, I, I think this is, not only is it a, it's a, it's a great question, but it's a telling point because I think we really want to be looking at these CMSs now as more of this notion of kind of a hub where there is an awful lot of data and information and insight should be going not only into these and coming out of them necessarily, but back into the rest of the organization. If we're trying to kind of leverage digital throughout our organization to, get, to kind of raise the bar a little bit, then we need to be bringing some of those insights that we're gathering from the web back into CRM. We need to be taking and leveraging the information and insight that we're getting from a customer on the phone to the support desk and using that in their interactions. You know, it's all about consistency and across all of our interactions, right? So Michael, I think this is important. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, like the reality is that integrations can be very complex. And I think that you, know, you really need to, to walk before you run. Um, you want to have very, very clear objectives as to what you want with your integration because it's great, you can do absolutely everything, but you should start with really what's going to be really successful for the project. Um, so make sure you're integrating things in the right way and you're pushing the right sort of data from one tool to the other. Um, because yeah, I've certainly seen integration aspects of projects, not only blue budgets, um, but just get, just snowball into a lot of complexity because there's, there's not a lot of sort of upfront thinking as to you know, what would make sense for a first release. Get it out there, see how successful the integration works across the organization, and then from that point, build on top of it. Don't try to do absolutely everything from day one. Great. Thank you for your question. Uh, we'll go to a couple more questions here for our panelists. Again, for our viewing audience, you're watching CMS Connected. We are live at the Seaport Hotel in downtown Boston, coming to you from Kentico Connection, Boston. If you're new to the show, and any of you here, you can go to cmsconnected.com. You can see this show and other shows on demand. We encourage you to share it, engage, interact. Again, this is a live monthly show that we normally do in our studio, but we're doing it more and more at events now, and we're here doing it live at this event. And it's, so, and it's cms-connected.com, in case you missed, you missed that point. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, your name place. and your question. Hi, I'm Chait. Uh, uh, I want to take the like focus a bit away from IT. If technology is uh, basically enabler and uh, nobody wants to build a bad tool, what I want to ask is, uh, I mean, how much of the like CMS like pitfalls we are, pitfalls we are talking about is more of like specification or the, like advice that we give to all these marketing teams or the clients? So you're asking how, how much of the how many of the pitfalls are due to the specifications, specifications essentially the the requirements advice that we give yeah. They'd like to say it's all in the... Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Heather. Do you, do you want to, well, how, just talk about the importance or the implications right. of having bad specifications. It's, I, it, I mean, the requirements are huge. The requirements are setting the expectations. So you can't, you know, you can't just say, I want to put up a CMS and I want to build it and not talk about to the right people about what you want to do and find out what your goals are. You've got to find out what the goals are. You have to specify it. And I, I think one of the key things that some people often miss is actually taking just the business requirements and the functional requirements and actually putting onto that, planning out how am I going to implement that, going through some technical specifications and understanding what are the out of the box or parts and controls that I'm going to use versus what do I have to customize a little bit. I, you know, I can't, I, I believe anyways that those specifications and requirements are, are key and integral to a successful project. You can't do it without. Like the requirements are everything on your project. Traceability is key. Being able to go from the you know the idea of a requirement down into the functional specification, the technical specification, the implementation. Whether or not you're using an agile approach with user stories or more traditional waterfall. Um, certainly, in terms of like project feels um, and and budgets being blown out, requirement ambiguity is a huge issue. Whereby you know I might have an idea of the requirements. Brian's got a different idea of the requirements. You know within the actual organization itself, or even the implementation company doing it. So I might have got the requirement. I hand it down. The technical specification introduces more ambiguity and can cause you know a lot of complexity there and a lot of overages. So you want to make sure that you're you're defining your requirements in a concise way and in a way that not only us as an implementation partner understands, but across your organization as well, the client actually understands the requirement, how it's being written, and how it's going to be implemented. And I actually have a, a real story on this topic, actually. So as the guy who does a lot of the requirements at my company, um, we worked with a healthcare organization in our local area. And they had a goal on their website to basically set up a page to allow them to donate to the foundation in many different ways. They wanted to run it on a Facebook campaign. They wanted it on the website. 
um, but the system that had control of the donation values and contacts was another system. So we went through a specking process. We ran through that plan, and they never told the people who are in charge of the foundation that they were going to do this. So I like to think of it as you have to keep your house in order and you have to communicate within your own organization, like what Michael was saying. If one team has a goal to do this, you better let the other people who touch that area know. In, a, in this situation, they didn't. So we literally had requirements. We had budget. We had technical go. And we were starting to write the project. And literally, we found out after all that was done that the people who run the accounting and financial aspect of accepting donations, they ran on an access application on one computer in the workstation. So I don't know how the heck we were ever going to take a web interface, a web application, a Facebook page, all these things to get these donations and automatically inserted it into the net machine when it was turned off because it was 4 a.m. <laughs> so um, you know, you have to talk. You have to communicate. You can't just let one person set those requirements up. Everybody who's on board has to be a part of it. And you have to think of it from all the different angles. So you can't integrate to a computer that's turned off. Did you have a follow-up? Well, I was talking more in terms of uh, a marketing team may want to do X, Y, Z things, and uh, if the like SharePoint is not going to do it, we should actually tell them right away, <laughs> not after it's done. <laughs> Sounds like he's yeah. got an interest in that question. Back to SharePoint. Jaded. Uh, um, so, I, I, you know, how about this? Who, who in the audience is a, is a is a partner? Raise your hand if you're a partner and you're implementing like Kentico, and who's a client or considers themselves to be. Come on, some people didn't raise your hand for anything. You're one or the other, no? You're just a hotel guest and this seemed like a cool conference to come into? <laughs> I'd, I'd come in here. I would definitely, yeah, exactly, but they're not. A, so here's my question. Uh, I'd love to get a story from you guys or somebody to, to answer this. What makes a bad client, right? Because we often point to, oh yeah, let's back on you now. But we often point to the agency or the implementer who's doing a bad job, but we all know we've wanted to fire clients or we've fired clients in the past. And some folks might want to take some notes here about what it is, you know, what kind of being a bad client is. Because anybody tell me some story about kind of when you've had a bad client, it's just impossible well, to make this work? Um, without mentioning names. Um, <laughs> no, I'd, I'd, I'd love to mention names, but my boss is over there, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not going to mention names. But I think, you know, like an uninvested client, a client that's not passionate about either the project or even their organization, that rubs off on the implementation partner. Like the best clients are the clients that come and they're so passionate about their organization, about the new challenges that they want to take on board with their content management system and their, their new online presence. Um, like that's, that's really easy for us to get excited in and then we get excited into their domain, into the, the, the project that we're going to develop. But yeah, I think the worst are definitely the ones that you just, you know, they, they just don't seem to be really into the whole process and they don't invest time in it. And on the other side of the coin, I think there's, there's clients and organizations that are, I don't want to say too invested because I don't think you'd ever be too invested, but too controlling. Oh, controlling. And will not let you, will not listen to you. You might be the expert, you might know the system and they would say, no, but we have to do it this way or no, it has to yeah. work this way and not willing to listen to the options or the, the other ways that something can be achieved. There's a million ways to skin a cat, so to speak. So you, there's, you know, the client has to listen to you. If they're not gonna listen to you, it's very un unhappy situation. So we've been doing this for a while now at my company. How long do we have? Because I have lots of client <laughs> items that I could <laughs> complain about, if, depending on how long we have. But um, I think one of the big red flags that I've seen with some clients is the fact that they literally have no attitude or, or care for what they're doing, especially in the parts they have to play and that are up to them, like creating content. So the red flag for me is, oh, we'll do content later. Don't worry about that. We'll, we'll figure that out the day before we go live. They think it's a, you know, a half hour mechanism. So they don't put enough thought or resources towards creating the content. The other uh, flags that I see are people who go through a training. I do a lot of the trainings in our company as well. And they're literally on Facebook during the training. Oh, do a lot. <laughs> 20, well, yeah, do you write specifications? Do you about do 20, training? About 20. OK. Yeah, yeah, I right. do a lot. All right. Uh, but if, if, if you're taking the time to go to a training class and learning about maybe how to use Kensco or other CMSs, and you're on Facebook or you're checking your email and not respecting that time that that trainer is giving, uh, and then come back and complain about it a month later, yeah. setting that they were not trained, and that's why it failed. Like, I, I have no room left for that anymore. Yeah. I don't have time anymore for that. I mean, it really You're irks me. Here. I definitely, yeah. Jessica, do you, oh, go ahead, Michael. No, I just got to agree with Brian. I think um, we haven't really touched on it too much. Like, content is vital 
to the success of a project, um, and certainly it needs to be considered from day one. There's no point in building this beautiful, lovely new house if you're gonna move in the old furniture and then put it even in the wrong room. Um, so you know, content has to be considered you know, as soon as possible because quite often it does delay um, the project release dates because the client has tried to leave it to the very last moment and then you know, it just doesn't work. At least CMS people love house and car analogies. I have heard so many house and car analogies. Oh, slow it down, Farmer. We got more questions. All right. Hey, over hey, here. hey, okay. hey. So, Jessica, you have some more questions back here? Yes, we, we do. got about uh, 10, 12 minutes left in the show. So, um, let's get to a couple more questions. Sponsored by Gatorade. Hi, it's uh, Keith Durant from Eccentric Arts. Uh, I think, Brian, you sort of uh, touched on what I'm going to ask, and it's really about how big an impact does. Uh, either proper client training or a client defining proper processes for what they're going to do after the site launches. Because I think Scott brought up the point that the project actually begins the day the developer hands over the keys to the car. So, so is training and redefining business processes a, an important element uh, or lead to CMS failures? Michael, you can't take this one. No, no, you guys work together. No, no, no. And Michael doesn't do that much training. <laughs> Heather, go ahead. Take a shot. Well, I was going to say, absolutely. I think it's huge. I, I mean, I've, I have been uh, trained to clients before that, and I would say most often they're in the government aspect of, of things, but where they're just there because they have to be there at the training session or because they have to learn how to use this, and they're not, they're not interested in it. And they were not part of the process to begin with. They were not in, in discussed or, or, or part of the project to start with. They weren't told that this was gonna happen. They were just right. said, okay, tomorrow you have to show up for training and now you're gonna start using this product. And it's like the third responsibility on their list. Exactly. They're not even the webmaster. They don't it's, wanna deal with it. Exactly, yeah, no, it's just one more thing that they've been told they now have to do. So I think you have to invest in those, that department and that becomes a whole new set of resources, whether, depending on what your content is. One person, you know, a whole team of people, whatever it might be, and you have to plan it out. Yeah. Yeah, Keith, I'll add to that. I mean, I think basically there's the training and then there's what happens after the trainer leaves. You know, what, what can you leave behind to help them understand? Is it a video clip of how to add the homepage slider to make this pretty thing happen the right way or not have it break? You know, is it a set of documentation or walkthroughs that may be involved? When I edit this piece of content in the content management system, this page will change. You know, it's, it's, sometimes it seems like it's really obvious to us as the implementators of the sites but if you're fresh coming into a new tool, you have a learning curve of the tool itself, but also, well, what happens if I do change this? Where, does the menu change? Does the page change? So you know, we like to combat that with leaving some sort of walkthrough, help user guide, something that draws a picture for them and says, this title field goes to this paragraph. If you want to change this image, you change it here. Because the, the user manuals and the system help that, that CMSs have are good, especially with Kentco. Um, but there's always the other side of it of, of the actual what is my job as the, as the person who has to maintain this website. So helping them with the leave behind is something that hopefully can, can fix that. Yeah, and it's, uh, Let's go to the next it's, a, it's a big deal for content. Um, it's even bigger deal for marketing teams because you know, me creating or editing the information on a privacy page uh, not that complicated to do, but if I want to actually run you know, a quite extensive marketing campaign uh, with a, a web CMS, I want to do web optimization, A-B testing, maybe I'm using personalization variants, I'm modifying my personas, that's a lot of work, and that requires you to actually invest time as to how to actually use those features and how to actually be able to you know, evaluate the actual overall performance of a campaign that you're running. So as these systems and platforms get more elaborate with their functionality, there's more of an owner or more uh, of a requirement on clients to actually, you know, get trained and learn how to use them. Otherwise, what have they invested in, you know? Right, it's not just one set of content now. It yeah, can be two and three yeah, sets exactly. of content for the same thing. And that's, you know, personalization is a great engine, but the content fuels the fire. You gotta have it, otherwise it's not gonna matter if you can personalize or not. I, I just think one, one quick point that you, your specific example of the privacy page brings to mind, which is that, sure, it's very easy to, to be trained to go in and edit the privacy page, but as anybody knows in here, editing a privacy page is a big, huge issue within an organization, just the governance and the approvals and all that sort of stuff involved. And I don't know if the question was specifically around this, but I think it's a big, huge point that it's not just the process of actually updating content, it's preparing customers, clients for understanding 
the wider process that's involved in getting any of this done, right? Who, who's responsible? Who's accountable for those sorts of things? What do those processes look like as well? I think we want to get to it. Oh, do you want to? Bring up the governance con comment. It goes back to not just once it gets into the CMS, which is what I think you're alluding to. It goes beyond where does it start? It start, starts on someone's desk, someone's idea that they want to make this change. It doesn't immediately go into the CMS and it gets handled by that. It's got to go through the internal processes first, the internal discussions. Now it's ready to get put into the technology to then start to go through its own workflow in that technology to get published. Uh, let's take one more question <clears throat> for our audience and then uh, we're going to start wrapping things up. We'll get some final points from you. Pick the winner of our tech basket, and uh, let's go ahead. What's your name and sure. what company? Uh, my name is Brand Klein from Data Inc. Um, this may be kind of a more specific instance of some of the same discussions we've been having as far as clarifying uh, requirements. But we've dealt with quite a few projects where the client, before they ever choose an implementation partner, bid out the design of the website separately. So what we receive as an RFP has what appear to be pretty straightforward requirements. We've done our bidding. We've done all of that, and then. Obviously, ideally, we would like them to get us involved very early and collaboratively in the design process so that we can align requirements with the design. Uh, but often, we ended up being handed this design that has a lot of implied requirements just by virtue of what the design is, looks like it's supposed to do um, that were never mentioned in the explicit requirements of the original RFP. So I guess my question to you, uh, to the entire panel, is do you have any thoughts or strategies on how to mitigate and deal with those, uh, those type of situations when they come up? Yeah, it, it, it always hurts. I've <laughs> seldom seen it done well. Um, not only the design, but also whenever information architecture is outsourced, which is going to happen if someone's doing the design. Really, it comes down to the, the quality of the design shop that you're going to, how much experience do they have with digital, with web? Are they you know, predominantly a print shop? Um, so yeah, it, it's going to be very difficult. I think what you're looking to do in that scenario is to really talk to the client and just outline to them that you're going to need a process of iterating over these designs and you're going to want to be able to give feedback based on your expertise as somebody you're going to implement um, and maybe you've got your own creative department anyway. So I think, yeah, it's very difficult just to, to take on board someone's design and say, yeah, we'll knock this out because really it, it may be that it's not buying into the best features of the CMS as well. And there may be aspects of that that they haven't really considered, which could, or, you know, could be opportunities for the customer as well. So I think it does have to be a, a dialogue between yourselves and the design agency and the client as well. But I, I, would, I would hope you'd get a chance to iterate. Yeah, I'd say that um, sports is really relevant here. Let's go to a sports analogy. Oh, dumb you like for the sports guy. Listen, I didn't say dumb it down. Okay. You said dumb it. She called you simple. I didn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> so what I'd like to point out too is even the you know 2004 USA basketball team failed, right? They had a that was a that was a debacle. It was tons of stars, right? Lots of stars right. in the team just couldn't figure out how to play together necessarily, yeah. right? And that's very similar here, where you've got I think just in general the more folks that you get, the, the more different groups that you've got trying to work together, it's that much harder. You're making it more complex. And I'd say to the point that you're making, certainly there's plenty of times if you already have a relationship as an organization with maybe a design for a branding team that like you've already got in place they know you really well okay then you're gonna bring somebody in who knows the technology and you want to try to make that marriage work into all the points that you were saying Michael about getting them to work collaborative collaboratively is really great but I would certainly try if I were starting out my, my, my tendency would try to be to have as few different teams that I'm trying to assemble as possible and try to go out and look for somebody that can bring both of those things to the table not everyone necessarily can or claims to but I I would try to narrow my, my scope to somebody who took my service. It's always, it's always a preference, but the reality is, is that you are going to get clients that due to the way they're doing their RFP process, or they have an existing relationship with the designer, they may have already gone to the designer and got design comps. Um, but yeah, ideally you'd want to, you know, it, we would advise clients to search around, maybe find a, you know, an implementation partner that can do all aspects of branding, creative, and also the build out as well, because you'll just get a more holistic solution. Right, at the end of I think, go ahead, I think to, to the integrators, the implement, in, um, uh, defense, there is probably potentially times when you have to walk away from an RFP because the client is not going to budge. They're yep. saying these are the designs, and the, they say you've got you know a tenth of the budget, and you've got get it done in two months. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, it's just not going to happen. So reality has to play into whether or not you're going to decide to continue with that particular that particular project when you get it at that stage. And I, I would request, sorry, I, I would request the time to basically say, I understand that you have what you think are the requirements for this design, but you know what? If you want us to implement it, we're going to go through our own discovery. 
And we're gonna do things and ask questions why, why it was done this way, and we're gonna double check it was set up right. And as a, as a good technology partner, I think you have that right to ask for that. When, because, yeah, having too many people in the, in the pod at once is, is definitely not helpful. And you have to do it the way you know to do it in the tool that they're choosing to do. So they may have things like the most popular or the most recent lists and tabs to show blog posts. But they don't understand what that means behind the scenes. Or they just think it's a label that you can just click a button and do that most popular thing. So we go through our own post discovery of the design team discovery. By the way, if you stated that way, I would say next, if you stated it to me that way. I would want to make sure that I explain to them or help people to understand why it is that it's really important to have you have that kind of holistic approach and insight, not just if you want us to do it, then whatever, they'll be like, yeah, I don't really know you that well, so thanks, okay. next. But anyway, All right, let's bring up Natalie. If you can come up here from uh, Falcon Software. Um, and while she's coming up, we're going to pick the winner of the tech basket. At the end of every CMS Connected, if you've watched the show, we put Scott on the clock in a segment called Rapid Fire. We're going to put you guys on the clock in just a second. And in 60 seconds or less, you're going to give this audience, both watching on the live stream and also here, you're going to give just a couple of takeaways on best practices on how to avoid the pitfalls of implementing the right CMS system or in choosing the right partner. So think about it for just a second. So uh, Natalie, if you would, how about a round of applause for the fair Natalie Evans here? <laughs> now, I've learned a long time ago not to pick the winner. So if you could go to these two young ladies in front here, and they can pick the winning ticket. If you pick yourself, you're going to be the most unpopular person in this room. <laughs> So while we're waiting to pick that, and uh, Natalie will bring it over to me, Michael, let's start with you, and we'll go right down the line. Takeaways, a couple of quick takeaways that people can walk out of this conference watching this show today to avoid the pitfalls of either the right implementation partner or the right system. 60 seconds, leave some for these guys. Go ahead. OK. Um, I would say initially focus on your RFP process. Do your homework. Uh, as an organization, try to be as clear as possible on what your goals are, what your objectives are for this project. And do your homework on CMS, have a look, see what features you require, what platform you want to use. And then whenever you've done that, try to find the right implementation partner. Um, not just look at their websites and see how pretty they are, but actually get under the hood. How have they implemented the website? What sort of features have they used? Have they you know, heavily customized it whenever that wasn't required? Uh, talk to the CMS vendor. So you know, call Kentigo, see what partners they actually say do a good job, and then give them a call. So I think, yeah, definitely from the RFP side, do your homework, get your objectives lined up, and then try to find the best people possible to do that for you. You guys so, have 10 seconds? Another 10 seconds? <laughs> uh, when I was Not a easy, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've just used them up by now, haven't I? Surely? <laughs> yeah. Nice round of applause for hey, Michael Kincaid Cheers, from Accenture Cards. <laughs> All right, Brian, uh, your thoughts. Okay, so for me, you know, if I was the client, one thing I would say is just get my house in order. Know and communicate through your different divisions of your company what the goals are, why are we having this project, you know, what, what, what customers are we trying to reach, um, and have measurements that are clear, definable measurements that can define success. Because we talked about failing, um, but how do you know if you fail if you can't measure the, the activity of the site or the conversion rate of the site? So have good measurements, know your customers well from a persona standpoint as well. And if you're in a B2B market or B2C space, if you're dealing with one certain demographic versus another, you're going to put content together differently. So definitely um, reach out, take customer surveys, try to get as much information from the people who are going to use your site, and then use that when you're defining the design, the content, and the implementation. You know, we, we have to do that to, to make sure that um, we're bouncing this change of the shopping cart to make it easier to buy for what reason. And how does that go back to the person who's using it? And how does that go back to the goal you've defined to measure success? So you want to communicate all those things really well. Not bad. Six seconds over on that no, one, sorry. Brian, but Good not job. bad. Uh, have, then how about a round of applause for Brian McKeever <laughs> from BizStream? All right, Heather, your thoughts. Uh, well, it, you know, I have to agree with everything that Michael and Brian have both said. So it it's, comes down to understanding, your, understanding the requirements, understanding your, your audience, not only the people that are going to use the website, but the people that are going to use the CMS and to, and to include them in the whole process. And to make sure that you are setting expectations um, properly, that you're actually dealing with the stakeholders and that you're actually setting your expectations so that the clients know and the people that are using it know what they're going to be getting at the end. 
Always use real content whenever you possibly can as you're going through the process. You, you, know, you can lorem ipsum it all the way, but it's always gonna destroy as soon as a person gets in there with the real news release that's gonna go out and all of a sudden they've, they need an image they didn't think they needed. Um, that's my synopsis. All right, well, you got 15 seconds to tell people how to get in touch with you. <laughs> <laughs> Hire me and not these right. two. That's what's exactly. All right, get your tickets out here uh, before we say goodbye on the show and tell you what's coming up on the next show. Scott has the winning ticket. What I do, do indeed. All right, so uh, 607. That doesn't narrow it down at all, does it? All right, everybody's, who's in still? Bingo? All right, five, uh, two, uh, here we go. Who's still in? Everybody excited? Got probably nine people excited. You're up for the two. Pit. Here it is. Six zero seven five two two. That's the number. Who do we got? Oh, right in the back up. there come with on the right hat up. on. What a round of applause. <laughs> and that is the winner of our uh, tech basket. <clears throat> um, again, thank you for being a part of the show. How about another round of applause for Michael, Brian, and Heather here? If you would like to continue our uh, conversations with our experts, please do. This it's is going to nice. be a 20-minute break for all of you who are here at the show. Uh, I would encourage you for a couple of things. If you are new to the show at CMS Connected, again, as Scott said, you can find it at cms-connected.com. The next show comes your way live Thursday, December 18th. We're going to be talking about portals and enterprise platform building solutions. You ready? For I'm going to do my homework on that one. Uh, that <laughs> That's our next show. So uh, once again, thanks to our lead sponsors on CMS Connected. Falcon Software and the good folks, Falcon Software. How about a round of applause for them? And my good pal and our good friend, Scott Lewer, and the good folks at Digital Clarity Group yeah. for making CMS Connected possible. And we want to thank you for all being part of our first live episode here on absolutely, site. Absolutely, absolutely. We are and definitely also, bringing in awards And now, also we want to thank Kentico for working with us at their event to bring this show to you live right in the mm -hmm. middle of their show and all the logistics go along with that. So folks at Kentico, thank you very much. So, as we like to say at the end of every show, get connected. Stay connected. At CMS Connected. See you next time Thanks, on CMS guys. Connected. <laughs> <laughs>